represents a number that they could rely upon when Mr. John was alive. So my motion in limine is, I certainly have no problem with the number after death, but there, there cannot be any testimony uh, unless there's a hearing outside the presence to satisfy the court that there's been some new scientific method that can, can allow that. I'm waiting on the new scientific method to allow that. You're familiar with that, are you not, Mr. Rogers? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm mean, familiar with the scientific basis that what has remained in the organs is not indicative. I, I, I don't, Mr. Schultz handling this, I don't think we're trying to, we're not, we're not trying to quantify that this has any, it, other than it's just present. Well, rather, you're familiar with the scientific <laughs> basis of Mr. Hermes's motion in the yard. And I only know about it because I've read about it. I read about it too. <clears throat> so you don't have any, well, I don't know. Do you have any objections to it? I doubt that it was necessary. But yet, we'll have yet another motion in limine regarding any kind of association with the level of. Marijuana in Mr. John's uh, body during his last hours of life versus whatever is shown in this report. Are we ready now? I'm ready, Judge. We're ready, Johnson. All right. You all may be seated. Hi, Mr. Hermes. You may call me next week. Your Honor, the State of Texas calls Dr. Chester Glenn. Chester Gwynn, G-W-I-N. Okay. Sure. Good afternoon. Um, I'm employed with the Dallas County Medical Examiner's Office, also known as the Southwestern Institute of Forensic Sciences, and um, I'm one of the medical examiners there. Okay. What does the medical examiner do? Um, we conduct inquests into death. Um, our <coughs> main job is to determine cause and manner of death. One of the main tools that we use to do that is through the autopsy examination. Okay. And so are you a licensed <coughs> physician in the state of Texas? I am. All right. What areas, of, what is your specialty or what are your areas of practice? Um, I'm board certified in anatomic and forensic pathology, and uh, I primarily practice forensic pathology. Okay. And what is the training and experience that you have received that qualifies you and allows for licensure uh, in the forensic pathology realm? I obtained a Bachelor of Science degree at Southwestern Adventist University in Keene, Texas. At that point, I moved to Southern California and attended Loma Linda University School of Medicine in Southern California. I obtained my medical doctorate degree there. Um, after that, I did a residency program um, in anatomic and clinical pathology. I completed that at Mount Sinai Medical Center in Miami Beach, Florida. 
Um, that was followed by a one-year forensic pathology training program at the Miami-Dade Medical Examiner's Office in Miami, Florida. Completed that, I moved back here to Texas, took a full-time job with SWIFTS. That was in 2008. Um, I took and passed my board certification exams in anatomic and forensic pathology, and then I hold a Texas uh, full unrestricted medical license. Okay. Um, have you been designated and accepted by every district court in this building as an expert in forensic pathology and in the practice of uh, performing autopsies? I'm not sure about every district court, but I have testified in many of the district courts here in this building. Okay. And you testify as an expert throughout the state? Yes, sir, I do. Okay. Uh, were you the medical examiner who did the autopsy on Boku Shemjan on, it was like September the 7th of 2018? I did. Okay. Can you tell the jury, first of all, I think you've already told us, if I'm not mistaken, that the purpose of an autopsy is to, to determine the cause of death? The cause and manner, yes, sir. Okay. So can you give us just an, an idea generally uh, what is involved in an autopsy procedure? Who receives an autopsy and why? Um, particularly in Dallas County, certain cases, certain deaths will fall under our jurisdiction. Um, any non-natural death uh, will be reported to us, and there are certain types of natural deaths that we will conduct um, inquest into. Um, if we deem that that body falls under our jurisdiction, um, that case will come into our office and will conduct an examination. Sometimes it may just be an external examination based upon um, the history and uh, medical history we may have. Um, a lot of the times we have to perform full autopsies. Um, and what that entails, is it's, it's a full examination of the body, uh, both externally and internally. Um, we will look at the chest and abdominal organs. We will look at the brain. We also take uh, different tissues and, and fluids for additional studies if needed, uh, such as toxicology testing. Certain cases may need uh, microscopic examination. Um, after all of, uh, of that, uh, we will rule on the cause and manner of death, and a, an autopsy report will be uh, issued. Okay. And did you generate an autopsy report of your findings? <laughs> as it relates to the autopsy performed on Mr. John. I did. And as part of the autopsy procedure in Dallas, uh, with our medical examiner's office, do you oftentimes also take photographs, uh, not only to document what you are seeing, but also help refresh your memory so that you can testify to a jury if needed at a later date? Yes. Did you do that in this particular case? I did. Okay. <coughs> so in addition to the autopsy report and the photographs, you also um, as a matter of course, do a diagram indicative of kind of the injuries and defects that you notice on the human body. Correct. I'll generate a, uh, what, what are my bench notes? Um, I will make just notes during the course of the autopsy examination. And then uh, in certain cases, such as this one, a court diagram will be generated. Okay. And the purpose of all of these is to accurately and permanently memorialize your findings. Correct. Your Honor, may I approach the doctor? Yes. And, uh, Your Honor, I do want to represent to the court just so that it's not shocking or alarming. Uh, the doctor has, uh, at a previous uh, meeting, identified certain photographs that he thinks are uh, relevant and needed for his testimony. They're going to obviously be photographs of, of the deceased Mr. John, so I just wanted to make sure I'm reminded of that. Okay. <coughs> Armstrong was remarked for identification as State's Exhibit Number 268. Can you tell me if that's going to be a fair and accurate and complete um, copy of your autopsy report of Mr. John? It is. Okay, and does it include that body diagram that we discussed earlier? Yes. And are you a custodian of records for the autopsy report for the Dallas County Medical Examiner's Office? I am. All right, I'm going to offer State's Exhibit 268. Do you want to see it, Toby? Uh, is the invitation the number? No, it's the body right now. Okay. <coughs> All right, Doctor, what was the unique IFS number that was assigned to the autopsy of both and John? IFS-18-16653-ME. Okay, is it fair to say that the autopsy report of Mr. John is the same as the autopsy report of Mr. John? Yes. Okay, and is it fair to say that the autopsy report of Mr. John is the same as the autopsy report of Mr. John? Yes. Okay, and is it fair to say that the autopsy report of
that, that upon one's death, at least as it relates scientifically at your lab, we really are more of a number for the purposes of making sure everything is accounted for and all the reports are combined. A, a, a unique number is generated. Um, it's much easier to for that to be a unique identifying feature for, for the decedents. Okay. And that number is going to be associated with any kind of testing that the ME's office or the, the crime lab does. That's correct. All right. And I'm going to show you, first of all, what's been admitted into evidence, the state's exhibit number two, is this document commonly referred to as the headshot uh, with the unique IFS number indicating this is Mr. John. Correct. We, uh, we will call it the identification uh, photograph, okay. and it is a picture of, of Mr. Uh, John's head. Okay. And I'm also going to show you what's been marked for identification as states exhibits 269 through 272. Would you look at those and tell me if those are going to be fair and accurate depictions uh, that you have selected as being important uh, to explain your testimony to this jury as it relates to how Mr. John died? Yes. Okay. I offer states exhibits 269 through 272. This is going to be a photograph also of the, um, the identification card of the individual that you did the autopsy on. Yes. All right, I offer 273 as well. No Would you, uh, and, and as we're going through here, I'm going to have you pause so that I can go ahead and, and show the jury certain items uh, of the photographs that you already indicated as being important. But if you would, just refer to your report. Let's start with the external examination of the complainant. Can you tell me what it was that you noted and what it was that you documented? Um, sure. Uh, Mr. Jean was a uh, seven foot one inch, 247 pound uh, black male. Um, he appeared well developed. Um, there were some articles, uh, items that came with him that were separate in sealed bags, which I documented there as items of clothing, um, some jewelry, and Texas driver's license, and um, a, a plastic card containing some identification cards. Um, Let me interrupt real quick. Uh, did you indicate his height to be a body length 73 inches or what would be 6 foot 1 inches? 6 foot 1, yes. Okay, I thought I heard a different number, but I'm sorry to interrupt. <clears throat> and then uh, there was ev evidence of medical intervention, um, which would be on the second page, and evidence of injury. Okay. Let's get to that. Let me go ahead and interrupt that real quick so I can show the Yarmouth Public State's exhibit number 269 to the jury. Yes. All right. Doctor, can you see this photograph? I can. Okay. Is this going to be uh, generally considered to be an as received photograph? of Mr. John as he's received by your laboratory? That photograph is not. Um, that is a photograph after the body's been cleaned after and evidence body. been taken. So before this photograph had been taken, there was evidence of treatment uh, or attempted treatment by a hospital. Is that right? Correct. So once he's received, you clean the body and then take this particular photograph? Right. Depending on the type of case it is, um, we'll take photographs, certain types of evidence collection, photographs, uh, x-ray, and then once the body's clean, we'll take another round of photographs. Okay. So the jury just saw this particular photograph, and it's fair to say that there's a very large, which looks like a suture wound that goes uh, pretty much from the center of his chest around his side. Can you indicate what that, what that would indicate to you? That's a thoracotomy incision that's been done at the hospital. Um, it's just an incision that's made from the mid-aspect of the chest extending to the left axillary region. 
Um, that incision is made completely into the chest cavity. At that point, they can access the, the heart and the lungs. Okay. Is that common practice, especially for a gunshot wound, where there might be emergency medical uh, treatment to the heart itself? It's not uncommon to see that type of medical intervention on cases that have made it to the hospital. Okay. And then I interrupted you. Would you pick up? You said we were at evidence of uh, treatment at this point? Uh, yes, there was evidence of treatment. Um, he had an endotracheal tube uh, that was in place, several uh, catheters that were inserted for vascular access, and then the thoracotomy incision that we had talked about. Um, and then as part of the internal examination, I also noted um, that there was a, a surgical repair of a defect in the heart. Okay, and can you tell me what that would indicate to you? Um, it, w it was, the, the heart was damaged by the projectile, um, and so the hospital, the doctors there, sutured um, that hole in the heart. Okay. And as far as the, the, the tube that was in the complainant's throat, would that also be evidence of emergency life-saving attempts? Yes. And so I guess after, after the complainant was pronounced dead, that he's removed from whatever machines would have been helping to, to uh, try and resuscitate him. And then they don't take that out, they just send Mr. Jean to, to you like that? Right. We prefer the hospital to leave all the treatment in place for us to examine. Um, for the most part, the hospitals do do that. How, how does a person end up getting to the medical examiner's office from the hospital? Uh, I do. Um, we have we contract with the transport company through UT Southwestern, um, but then depending on which hospital it is, um, we have our own um, in-house crew that will uh, pick up certain bodies. Okay. All right. The next question I want to ask you is: You have a, a section. Well, do we finish evidence of treatment? Yes. Okay. Is there anything else that you want to convey to the jury about evidence of treatment? No. No question in your mind that it appears that Mr. John ended up at a hospital and it appears that there was life-saving attempts made to keep him alive. Correct. And obviously, those failed. Yes. Okay. Um, would you discuss the evidence of injury at this point? Yes. So Mr. Jean had a gunshot wound of the chest. The entrance wound was on the left side of the chest. It was right above the left nipple. Um, as it entered the body and went through the soft tissue and musculature of the left chest. It hit the anterior aspect of the left fifth rib. At that point, it hit the upper lobe of the left lung. It hit the heart, which we had talked about that the hospital had sutured that defect. Um, it then went through the diaphragm, which is a, th a thin muscle layer that separates your uh, chest contents from your abdominal contents. It went through the diaphragm, it hit the stomach, it hit the intestine twice, and then it came to rest within uh, a muscle um, in the left abdominal cavity. Okay. And I'm going to show the jury now, States Exhibit number 270, is this going to be a photograph of the bullet wound, the entrance wound to Mr. John? Yes. Okay. And just so that the jury knows, there was no exit wound, is that right? That's correct. Uh, the bullet, can you tell us, the, the bullet stayed fully within his body and it came to a rest in a, like a dense muscle area called the psoas muscle? The psoas muscle, yes. All right. Judge permission to uh, publish 270. Yes. The, the jury's going to be looking at this photograph, again, just as a matter of uh, an identification marker, is the entrance going to be just above the left nipple? That's correct. Kind of describe the path that the, that the bullet took within his body. Um, you said that one of the areas that was damaged was the heart. Correct. Can you give the jury some sort of an indication of the extent of the damage? Um, the the bullet actually hit the left ventricle, which is the largest chamber of the heart. That's the chamber that pumps oxygenated blood to the rest of the body. Um, that defect had been sutured by the hospital, um, but it looked to have been full thickness through the ventricle. Okay. Is 
that is significant uh, injury to the human body. Yes. Um, being the largest ventricle, or the, is it where the most amount of blood is being pumped from the heart to the entirety of the body? Correct. And then you indicated that there was uh, also injury to the lung, the stomach. Ex explain, if you would, the extent of those injuries. The bullet perforated through uh, the edge, the medial edge, that's closer to the midline of the body. It perforated that upper lobe of the left lung. Um, so there would have been bleeding from that, that wound as well. The lung is a very vascular organ. Um, the bullet then went into the abdominal cavity through the diaphragm. It struck and went through the, the stomach. Um, so there was leakage of gastric contents or stomach contents into the abdomen. Can you give us any kind of an idea what a human being would feel with these injuries? Um, I would expect that it would be painful. Um, but again, it's, it's highly variable on, you know, how quickly a person would die from it. You know, the adrenaline that may or may not be coursing through the body at that time. Okay. Is the individual going to be losing a significant amount of blood very quickly? From these injuries, yes. show states exhibit number 271 so that no one gets antsy. It's just a, an x-ray, correct? Correct. And does it show where the bullet uh, finally came to a rest uh, within Mr. Jean's body? It does. Okay. Now with an x-ray, it's not a three-dimensional <coughs> photograph, correct? That's correct. Okay. Judge, may I take off my jacket? Yeah. Okay, I promise you that's going to be it. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. All right. What, Mr. John weighed what, 247 pounds? Yes. Okay. So, and he was six foot one, okay? I weigh over 250 and I'm five So, I'm actually going to probably be a little wider than him. But as far as just so that the jury can kind of see, um, the entrance is going to be about here. Is that correct? Correct. Just the left nipple. Yep. And as far as where the psoas muscle is, where the bullet was recovered, just from a side angle, Your Honor, made the doctor step down. Yes. Could you show on the jury where on my body, approximately how far back between the stomach and the back we're talking about? Yes, the psoas muscle is, is deeper in the abdominal cavity. Um, it rests right up against the spine, and it's going to be probably about right in this area. And I can't see where you're at, but is that going to be approximately midway or a little bit past midway? Closer to my back than to my front? Uh, yes, it's the muscles deeper in the abdominal cavity. Okay, so approximately right there. Yep. Okay, but that's that's just the position front to back, my stomach to my back, correct? Correct. All right, would you show then the jury using my back where the, the bullet came to rest just from this vantage point? Um, the muscle is right up against the spine, um, so if I go midline, um, the spine, it's going to be uh, about an inch or so away from the spine. Okay. So let me get this, if you wouldn't mind. I'm gonna, I've got a, a dowel rod. Since I've got you up, I might as well do this now. Can you show me on my chest again for the jury approximately where the entrance wound is? And I'll go ahead and point out for you, this would be my left nipple. Okay. Um, the entrance wound is going to be Right about here. Okay. So using this then as the entrance, can you give me the degree down with the dowel rod showing kind of what the angle or the path of the bullet would be? It's going to be about like that. Okay, and I'm going to hold that in place. All right. So for the jury, although the entrance would be here, obviously you can't stick this dowel rod through my heart. Right? Well, you probably don't want to see that. <laughs> All right. Go ahead and have a seat back up there, doctor. So although the entrance was here, does the dowel rod, as I have it situated on my body, indicate kind of the pathway through the body, although the jury would have to position it here where my heart is? Correct. Okay. So, and do you have the dowel rod ending approximately where the bullet would have ended, except it would have been back here in my back? 
Correct. Okay. Now, you can't give, you, you have no idea about where Mr. Jean was or what he was doing, correct? That's correct. And you have no idea where the shooter was, is that correct? Not specifically, no. Okay. But the path within the body is set. It is what it is. Is that accurate? Yes. So if a person is, unless the shooter is on the roof of this room and shooting down, although that's a possibility, that's probably unlikely. Would you agree with that? I would say that's an unlikely scenario. Okay, fair enough. And I just want to use that just as an example. But for, for the purposes of the path through the body, is it fair to say that the bullet is going to be coming from the other end of the stout rod? Wherever the, the body may have been positioned? Yes. Or if the person had been sitting down, or even if the person had been laying on his back? The bullet is going to be coming in the direction that the dowel rod indicates through the path of the body. Is that right? That's correct. The only variable is where the gun is. That or if there was a dense interposed target, something in between the body and the firearm that the bullet struck first. Okay. Do you have any indication that there was anything? Um, you, know, you saw the... Well, let me just ask you this. As far as through the... We had a firearms expert look at the bullet, so I'll leave that to her area of expertise. But as far as throughout the body, bullets can be deflected also internally. Is that right? They can be. Okay, I think I'm done. Is there anything else that I need to show the jury as far as this pathway? No, sir. Okay. Within the body itself, it is always possible that a bullet could be deflected. Is that right? It's possible. In this particular case, did you find any evidence which made you believe that the bullet was deflected within the body of Mr. John? I did not. You did find a rib that did indicate that it had been nicked by the bullet. The bullet did strike the rib. Do you believe that the rib deflected the bullet, making the path as you've shown the jury? I do not. Okay, tell me why. Uh, bullets, when they enter the body and strike organs or bones typically follow a straight line path. Um, even hitting a more dense bone such as the pelvis or a long bone of the extremity, um, in my experience I have not seen a significant deviation of that bullet along its flight path. Is it your belief that the path that the bullet <clears throat> took was based on the position of the complainant and the position of the shooter? It's based on the relationship of the muzzle of the firearm to the, to the body. Again, just exactly what I, we showed the jury. The bullet was traveling in the path the dowel rod was indicated. Correct. So, however you, the body is positioned, least to be the bullet or the, the gun, this was the path that it took him. Correct. Okay. I want to show the jury. Well, you already indicated to the jury that you were able to recover the bullet that was from the body, is that right? I did. Okay, and you already indicated where. Would you like to publish that in your Honor 272? When you recover a bullet from the body, what do you do with the doctor? Um, the bullet's recovered. Um, it's cleaned, just, you know, wipe, or, you know, washing the blood and the soft tissue off. Um, the projectile is then photographed on top of the envelope that I will then put the projectile into then that envelope is sealed and uh, signed with my signature and date. And I'm going to show you what's been already admitted into evidence of State's Exhibit Number 250. Is this going to be the bullet, the packaging at least for the bullet that was recovered and then sent forward to the uh, to the firearms folks at your lab? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> So. Alright. And then the next part of the autopsy report indicates the internal examination. 
Um, I don't. I don't necessarily think the jury needs to to hear anything that's not really relevant to the cause of death. But if you would, could you just give them an overview of whatever your internal examination was and whatever your findings were? Correct. Uh, the remaining uh, internal examination was unremarkable. Um, there wasn't any significant natural medical disease uh, that Mr. Jean had. Okay. Was Mr. Jean otherwise a healthy human being? Yes. Okay. Was there, let me just ask you this. Was there anything else that you noted in his autopsy that caused his death other than the gunshot wound? No. Was there any evidence that any of the treatment that he received either from paramedics or from the hospital caused Mr. John's death? No. I also wanted to ask you one other question. When I was talking to you about internal deflection, you said that it's your opinion that the bullet was not redirected within the body of the complainant. That's correct. Do you have an opinion as to whether or not that bullet could have been redirected by any of the emergency life-saving measures done at the hospital? Yes, the bullet was not you know, misdirected by the uh, hospital staff. So the bullet going the path that it did and ending where it did, again, is positional and has nothing to do um, with any deflection or treatment maneuvering or anything like that. Correct. I want to talk to you about the toxicology. As part of your autopsy process, do you also uh, extract blood both uh, from vitreous fluid and also from the femoral artery? Yes, the, uh, the items one through five that we could see there um, is blood. Uh, we collect urine if it's available, uh, vitreous, which is the eye fluid, and then skeletal muscle. Okay. So you, you withdraw from, from the body a certain bodily fluids for the purposes of tox toxicological examination, is that right? That's correct. And uh, is there an indication that there was marijuana or THC present uh, in Mr. John's body? Yes. No alcohol, though? None detected. And then, Doctor, you, um, on your findings, can you go over with the jury, please, what your findings and conclusions are? Um, yes, the uh, the number one finding was gunshot wound to the chest and to the abdomen. Um, number two is borderline cardiomegaly. I'm just saying that his heart was a little enlarged, 410 grams, but nothing significant. Um, and then, obviously, the reported history that we had at the time that, that uh, he was shot by an off-duty police officer. Um, and then it was my conclusion that Mr. Jean died of a gunshot wound to the chest and to the abdomen and that the manner of death was homicide. Dr. Gwynn, would you agree, having been a physician for how many years now? Uh, good question. So I'm getting older, it's hard to remember. Um, 11 years in forensics and then five years in medical training. And then, yeah, so do the math. <laughs> I, I'm just going to say you've been a doctor for a while. Right? It's been a while. Um, but is shooting a person with a gun firearm and act clearly dangerous to human life. It is. And is a gun a firearm? A hand, is a handgun a firearm? Yes. And is a firearm a deadly weapon? It is. Um, you, I had asked you, or God bless you, Judge, I had asked you earlier um, whether or not you had a belief as to whether or not the medical treatment either by paramedics or the hospital um, could have had any kind of bearing on the location or path of the bullet. You seem very confident that it did not. Can you tell me why? Where was the bullet recovered, and why did you think that it had nothing to do with that? The bullet was recovered in the abdominal cavity. Um, the surgical intervention that was done was in the chest cavity. Um, there was a hole in the diaphragm where the bullet had passed through. Anything that the medical intervention team had done would not have caused that bullet to have gone through the diaphragm, the stomach, and the small intestine, and then pushed it into the, uh, the muscle. That would have been impossible. Yes, sir, it was. Uh, a lot of 
of damage when it hit the left ear. Yes. Uh, and the way the bullet struck the left ear bullet, it, it uh, would cause tremendous amount of bleeding uh, immediately. Correct. Okay. Uh, and it's one of it, it could easily be a, a, a what you sometimes term as a rapidly fatal one. Yes. Most of the uh, bleeding, though, is it uh, inside the body? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and uh, obviously, there's been evidence that uh, there was some uh, CPR administered by police officers as well as uh, paramedics. Uh, and it appears that the, uh, there was blood uh, that came out the left side of the wound onto the floor. Uh, would uh, CPR, those efforts, just uh, keep pumping? Would, would it actually be pumping the blood out of the body, out of the heart, because of the hole that's in the heart? There would be blood leaking out of the existing hole, and then chest compressions would be contributing to continuing to push blood through the vascular system. about the angle of the bullet, uh, where it was located. One of the things, you, when you're doing measurements of the body, the standard, one of the standard measures you should do is you weigh the body and you measure the length of the body, correct? Correct. As far as uh, how thick the torso is, uh, uh, the width of the chest, that type of thing, you don't usually do that. No, sir. Uh, you just describe the body shape. Generally speaking, yes. Uh, and is it uh, fair to say that Mr. John would, he was a 247 pound man, six foot one, and I think you said he was well built, uh, muscle. Uh, yes. He had a, a big chest, big shoulders, that sort of thing. Yes, sir. Uh, but you didn't take any direct measurements of how uh, deep his torso was uh, when the bullet entered or where the bullet uh, was lodged? I did not. Uh, the bigger a person's torso is, uh, though, uh, as compared to, a, to another person, though, might change the angle as, as how the, the bullet went through the body, correct? Uh, if you had a deeper or a, a thicker torso, it, it wouldn't be quite as severe if you were a thin person. That's true to an extent, but, it, you know, a, a body laying on the table where gravity is pulling, you know, tissues downward, those measurements are not going to be necessarily accurate or reflective of whatever scenario that that shooting occurred in, um, you know, because bodies are fluid and in motion. Uh, so, you know, body weight is going to be distributed differently. Okay. Uh, that's one of the things you have to look out for uh, in autopsies because bodies are really fluid in motion uh, when the shooting actually happens. Yes. Uh, a person can... Uh, turn their body, move their body uh, uh, very quickly, especially in a situation where they may be afraid, trying to avoid being shot, things like that. Possibly. Certainly not out of the room. That's just kind of common sense, right? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part. That's just kind of common sense, right? I, I didn't hear the question oh, before. That, a, a person will, uh, can move their body quickly if they're frightened of trying to avoid being shot. I think, yes, I can. I mean, I would. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's common sense that. Now, the, uh, uh, you said that the, the bullet entered above the left nipple and it, it struck the uh, fifth rib. Yes. Did I get that right? Yes. And it, and it struck the, the front of the part of the uh, fifth rib, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, the report says that uh, there were fractures of the, of the uh, fifth rib. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, 
prosecution and use the word nick the uh, rib. Uh, would you describe it as nick or is fractures uh, the better uh, description? Well, fractures is you know what I use, so I, I would say fractured. Um, the rib itself in that area is not that wide, um, so it you know could have hit the lower portion of the rib and still fractured it. Okay. But you didn't take a photograph of, of the injury to the rib? No, I did not. Uh, and you don't remember exactly how the rib went, correct? I know it was fractured. Yeah, I mean, other than that, I mean, you can't say it was big or uh, you don't have the particular portion of where the rib was struck, even though it was thin, do you? No, I, I just know that it was struck and fractured. Okay. Now, you said that, in, in your experience, that uh, the rib, when the bullet would strike uh, the rib, uh, it would not change it or, or cause a, 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 a severe deviation of the angle at all, correct? Correct. Uh, is it possible that it could cause a slight change of the angle? A slight change, possibly. Okay. And the uh, projectile that you recover, the type of that ammunition uh, that's used, it, it, when it strikes an object or a body, it tends to flat. Is that right? Yes, I believe they're designed to do that. Uh, and when a, when a bullet uh, goes into a body and flattens like that, it will begin to well, it'll begin to tumble many times as it goes through its path of body, right? If it if it starts to strike, you know, more solid objects, it could it could start to tumble or wobble. Okay. And we actually see that in the X-ray, do we not? Uh, that the uh, the flat the, the front of the projectile is pointing upwards. Um, I don't know. I'd have to look at the x-ray again. May I approach it? Yes. <clears throat> Let me show you uh, what's been entered as the States 271. Uh, if you could look at the projectile uh, in that x-ray. Okay. Does it appear that the... Uh, flattened out part of the projectile is, is pointed up at that angle? Um, it appears that the, uh, and when you say flattened, which which flattened end are you referring to? The, the uh, it, it looks to me like the more flattened and spread out end, uh, end of the projectile is pointed upward. Right, I would agree that the more deformed uh, end of the projectile, which is typically the front end of the projectile, um, is pointing um, more upward. But the, the problems with x-rays is that it's two-dimensional and so it doesn't give us a very accurate 3D spatial relationship of the projectile in the body. And you said that the bullet uh, was recovered from, is it the psoas? Am I pronouncing it? Psoas. 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 That's a muscle that uh, uh, is very near the spine? Yes, it sits, you, you have one on each side, and it sits right up against the spine. Okay. Uh, and it looks like the x-ray, we can see the spine, and the bullet seems to be right next to it. Um, I, yes, but again, you know, the relationship of the, the bullet actually in the body, it's difficult to say with certainty based right. on films because it's a 2D image, and we're dealing with 3D right. uh, Recovery of the bullet. My, my question, uh, and I have no idea, is, is it being that close to the spine, uh, impacting like that, would that have any effect on the, the nervous system of the spine at all? No, because it didn't strike the spine itself. It was just in the muscle next okay. to the spine. All right. Thank you. Uh, Hermes talked to you and showed uh, how uh, uh, 
when you're determining the, the path of the bullet, you can't, it's not like a CSI or the really old uh, medical examiner show Quincy that you can't tell exactly what happened from a crime scene just by uh, examining the wounds of the body. Is that right? We can't tell exactly, um, but we can make consistent with statements. Right. But as far as where the shooter is and uh, uh, how the body was positioned, you do it all. Um, you can tell where the muzzle is and, and uh, the shooter and the person shot can be in a number of different positions. Um, right, as long as we're keeping that trajectory relationship the same. Okay. And, and again, I, I'm not the same size, but is this roughly the, the, the angle you're, you're talking about? Yeah, I would pull the bottom more forward. Sorry. Rotate the bottom end more forward towards your belly button. There you go. Okay. Yep. Now, uh, and it could happen in a number of ways. Uh, Mr. Hermes talked about a couple. Uh, if an if a individual were facing a person, if walking up towards a person uh, and saw a firearm, if they ducked and the person shot at them, that could cause that type of deal as long as it's that relation? If you're flexed forward like that, yes. Okay. And that could happen a number of ways. A person can duck quickly and be in that position. Well, it's not only the ducking, but it's also moving your forward portion of the torso right. over. Yes. Am I, am I positioned that way? It appears so, yes. Okay. And, and when I got that way, I was ducking, correct? Yes. Okay. As long as it's in that position, and however you get there, ducking or bowing or whatever, that, that, that could be a scenario. That, that would happens. be consistent. And lawyers uh, do this often. We get we put medical examiners and ask all kinds of opinions about angles and body positions and likely scenarios. Correct. Correct. And usually the the most you can say is that's that could be consistent. That's correct. Okay. Uh, Yara, can I Debbie uh, permission put a chair here so I can sit? Sure. that's been discussed in court is sitting on a couch. Uh, and obviously, if a person sitting on a the couch, they could be placed in the same type of position. Make sure I get it right. Like this? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, and be shot uh, so the bullet penetrates the body of this man, correct? If you're sitting upright like that, no. No, but I mean, if you're sitting, then you can put your body in a number of positions for that to happen? Yes, if you're sitting and flex forward like you are there. Okay. Yes. I'm in the I'm in the proper position now? Yes. Okay. But you'd have to be bent over this forward and then uh, receive the shot from this angle? Correct. Okay. Uh, and if uh, I were getting up off the couch and I bent forward like that, then I could also be shot in that same position? Yes. Okay. Now, people uh, obviously get up off couches in different ways. and. And can vary because of the physical condition, correct? Yes. Okay. You can you can bend forward like that to get up, or you can also just get up like this. You can. Okay. It just depends on the person and, and how their body reacts or, or how they stand up. Or how they're feeling. Sure, it could be any number of variables. Could be your age, uh, what type of physical shape you're in, that sort of thing. Yes. Uh, and as far as how a body falls, you can't give us any... Uh, opinion with medical certainty how that's going to happen in the game. I cannot. Uh, a person can be shot in the manner that Mr. Jean was shot and could run half a block or a block. You've heard of cases like that? I've, you know, anecdotally have heard of cases and seen video footage where people have been shot in a similar manner and, you know, taken steps or run several yards okay. before collapsing, yes. And a person could also be shot, they were ducking this manner and just simply fall backwards and collapse. Can, yes. Uh, it just depends on, on what happens to that particular person. Yes. Okay. Uh, you can't tell a jury with any certainty whether they're going to fall forward or whether they're going to fall, fall, fall backward. I cannot. Now, when a bullet strikes the body, though, it, it does so with a high velocity, correct? Um, 
Right. It depends on the, the ammunition and the firearm being used. But yeah, it's in this it's, case, obviously, it caused a lot of damage. It did. Uh, would you agree? I, I, I don't know the exact ballistic experts. Obviously, keep track of how, how far or fast bullets uh, are fired from weapons, but we could probably agree it was coming out pretty quick. Yes, I think for you know for handguns, you know it's up, you know eight. 800 to 1,200 feet per second, okay. you know, depending on the fire. And when a bullet strikes a body, obviously that can cause the body or will cause the body to react, won't it? Um, it can. Okay. Could knock the person backwards? It's possible. Okay. They might fall forward, too. It's possible. Okay, they, they could just stand there for a few minutes. They could stand up, yes. Yeah. You, you just don't know. Everyone, every body probably acts, uh, reacts differently. It's a case-by-case -case scenario. Obviously. And, and most of, the, uh, of what you find out about that is through uh, police reports, stories, video, as you said, or what you saw uh, as what could happen with the body. Yes, that's what I have to rely on. Okay. But you can, as a medical examiner, say the body was, if a person was sitting on the couch and they were shot right there, that's going to cause them to fall forward, or it's going to be backwards, or they'll fall on the couch, you just don't know. I mean, I can say, I can use consistent with statements, but right, with 100% certainty, I can't say that. Okay. All right. And if they were leaning more forward like this, uh, could it possibly make them, if they were getting off the couch, to fall forward? It could. Just a couple of questions, Judge. Uh, Dr. Gwynn, um, I neglected to ask you. I think Mr. Shook did ask a couple of questions uh, in that vein, but I do want to confirm. There's there's absolutely nothing uncommon with the ability of an individual who's shot with a small caliber bullet, like in this case, for that person to have several steps of purposeful movement, I think is how you described it to me when we met before. It is. Okay. So if you were to pull out a gun, sir, and you were to shoot me with a 9 millimeter, it could hit me, correct? It so could. you were a good shot. Now, your testimony with Mr. Shook was that how a person responds to having been shot, you could have purposeful movement a couple of steps. You could have purposeful movement of no steps. You could have purposeful movement even in the weird cases where you've seen a person run for, for some length, correct? That's correct. It, 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 just, it really just depends a lot on the individual. Yes. Is that fair? That's fair. Okay. But isn't it true, like, when, uh, we've all seen, I know this to be the case, we've all seen the movies where a guy takes out a handgun and he shoots somebody and it, like, blows them out a window, right? I've seen that. That's not true, though, right? I've never heard of that happening. Right. The mass of the bullet is not going to blow the body back. It's not going to, not right? with that caliber of bullet, no. It's going to hit you, and just as you testified, the effect of that bullet is going to be an individual one based on the individual. Uh, maybe that individual could take a couple of steps forward, fall forward. Maybe that person doesn't move at all and just drops. Maybe that person moves forward and falls back. That's just, that is an individual thing that could be different. 16 different times here, 6 different times here. Just, it depends on the individual. It does. But if there was any kind of, um, I just want to make sure, if there's any kind of suggestion that the bullet would have blown Mr. Jean, a 247-pound man, backwards by, with its mass, that's not accurate, is it? I don't think so. Thank you. I'll pass the witness. I have nothing further here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, a subject to recall, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Goyen. Thank you. Thank you. You didn't take any exhibits of the court reporter gets mad if you did. You're on the state of Texas calls Robin Carr. Okay, how are you? I'm okay. Could you uh, let the court reporter know what your full name is and spell it for her, please? My name is Robin Carr, R-O-B-Y-N, last name C-A-R-R. -R. Okay, and Ms. Carr, what do you do for a I am a crime scene analyst for the Dallas Police Department. Okay, what does a crime scene analyst with the Dallas Police Department do? Uh, a crime scene analyst goes out to all major crimes against persons calls, such as homicides, suicides, assaults, kidnappings, um, robberies, officer-involved shootings, anything basically where someone is put in direct danger or harm. Okay. Uh, is it kind of like a, a crime scene investigator that we see oftentimes in movies? Yes. Okay, sound, that sounds like it would be a fascinating life. Is it as good as it's depicted on TV shows? It is. It, it may not be as as uh, glorious as TV, but yes. You enjoy it? I do. How long have you been doing it? I've been a crime scene and, and investigator for Dallas for five years now. Okay. Well, outstanding. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. I want to talk to you about September the 6th, 2018. Were you on duty on that particular day? Yes, I was. And were you dispatched to... Uh, 1210 South Lamar Apart Apartment 1478 on that particular evening to, uh, I guess, process a crime scene uh, where an individual had been shot. Yes. Okay. Do you have a copy of your report? Have you read your report? Yes, I do. Okay. And you understand how this works. The rules of evidence don't allow me just to stick a sticker on your report and give it to the jury. Um, you got to testify live, right? Yes. Okay. So tell me, what, the, what did the crime scene look like? Let's just start from uh, when you got there, what did you do? Uh, when I first arrived at the crime scene, um, I spoke to Detective Ibarra, who I was told he was the lead detective on the case. And um, after that, I spoke to my supervisor and my manager to decide what was going to be the next step. Um, I had to change the angle of my vehicle so that I could back into the area. I drove the, the crime scene shooting van to the um, to the location. So I waited for um, Amber Geiger to come into the vehicle so that I could take photographs of her and uh, continue processing the scene once we got a warrant. Okay. And do you see the individual, uh, the defendant in this case, Amber Geiger, do you see her in the courtroom? Yes. All right, would you please point to her and tell me what she's wearing? Um, a dark colored jacket and maybe a pink pink shirt. All right, let the Those record reflect the witnesses identified the defendant in open court. You saw her there that particular evening? Yes. And as part of the standard operating procedures, did you take photographs for evidentiary purposes of the defendant as well as the other crime scene issues and elements? Yes, I did. Okay. Approximately what time did you get on scene? Can I refer to my report? Yes, ma'am, you can. Um, I arrived at the scene at 11.20 p.m. Okay. And did you go up to apartment number 1478? Yes, I did. All right, before we go through the front door, did you notice anything on the outside of the door that you noted in your report? Um, there was a key hanging from the doorknob. Okay. So there was a key that was in the, the doorknob on the outside of the door? 
Yes. Okay, and, then, and I'm sure you took some photographs of that, right? Yes, I did. Okay, and did you uh, notice whether or not there were any obvious signs of forced entry? No, there did not appear to be. Okay, and what, what are some of the signs of forced entry that you would see? Um, have you ever worked uh, burglary of habitation cases before? Yes. All right, what are some of the telltale signs of forced entry? Usually if there's forced entry to a door, um, you'll see like the dead, the dead bolt could, could either be off the door completely or it could just be <coughs> hanging off sometimes. It could be uh, damaged to like the top of the door frame and the side of the door when you actually open it the side will usually be damaged. Okay. So, uh, and I guess every, like everything else in our lives, everything is different, but forced entry is usually some sort of uh, indication on the door or on the, the door siding, which indicates someone going <coughs> through a locked door. Yes. Okay, you didn't see any of that? No. Okay, so let's go inside the apartment. Uh, when you went inside the apartment, um, did you notice whether or not the television was on? Yes. Was the TV on? Yes, the TV was on. In the living room? Yes. Okay. And did you notice uh, whether or not there was a laptop computer on the ottoman? Was it on? Yes. Both of those were emitting light, is that correct? Yes. And from their positions in the living room, um, were they, where, what direction were they emitting light or, or shooting light towards? Um... Towards the couch. Okay. <coughs> so let me do this. Your may I approach the witness? Yes. And you can attempt to do two things at once in this car. Like you just very quickly. You've already testified. And these photographs have already been admitted. So I don't need you to go through all of them again right now. But I believe earlier today you did look through this stack, and do you agree that these are going to be the photographs, or actually just a portion of the photographs that you took on September the 6th? Yes. Okay, and these are going to be, for purposes of the record, States Exhibit Number 53 through States Exhibit Number 187. Is okay. that right? Yes. Okay. And while I'm doing that, Your Honor, I'm going to give the contents of States Exhibit Number 251 to the Deputy Sheriff's. <coughs> All right, let's start with the photographs. Can I publish Judge? Yes. Judge, I'll tell you what, I actually think this Elmo performs better with the lights on. And let me turn off this light. All right. Um, Ms. Carr, is this going to be the photograph that you took of the defendant on September the 6th, 2018? Yes. Okay. And this apparatus around the defendant's waist, is this commonly just referred to as duty gear or the utility belt? Yes. All right, as far as weapons that the defendant had at her disposal on that particular evening, what is this weapon right here? Um, her taser? It's a taser. It's, it's a device that shoots an electrical current that can incapacitate a person. Is that right? Yes. I don't object to the prosecutor testifying. Right. Whether it can incapacitate, there's a, just object to his testifying. Retrace your question. And is that States Exhibit 53? Yes, ma'am. States Exhibit 53. And Ms. Carr, if you would like to, you can move that screen around so that you don't have to look up. Just however you're most comfortable, okay? Okay. All right, going back to States Exhibit 53, you've indicated this was a taser device. Is that right? Yes. All right, do you know what a taser device does? Yes. What does it do? It shoots out an electric probe that gets inserted into an individual's skin upon contact. Okay. 
And generally, when you've seen that, what does the individual do? I haven't seen it happen in person. Fair enough. Do you know what this item is right here on her waist? Can you point? Um, I'm not sure. Okay, you don't know what this device is? I'm not sure. Okay, and what is this right here? Can you point to it again? Yes. I'm not sure. All right. State's exhibit number 54. Can you now see what this device is? I believe her pistol. Okay. Did you have Okay. All right, so this particular device here, is that going to be what? Her pistol and holster. Okay. And you, you don't know what this is right here? I can't tell the contents of it. Right. States exhibit number 55. Is that a better depiction of that item? Yes, a pistol. Okay. And can you now tell what that is? No. States exhibit number 56. What is this device right here? A uh, radio. Police radio? Yes. Okay. And can you tell what that is on the back of her belt? I'm not sure. Okay. States exhibit number 57. Can you now tell what this device, what this is? No, I can't. So did you seize her gun from her man? Yes. Right. Is this going to be a photograph, states as in number 58, of the handgun that you took from this guy? Yes, it is. Okay. States exhibit number 59. Does that indicate the, the unique serial number of the handgun that you took from the defendant? Yes. States exhibit number 62. Do you do um, something called an ammo count or an inventory of ammunition? Yes. All right, tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, what's the purpose for doing that? So when we collect a weapon from an officer, we always do a weapons count, and basically we take their weapon and we uh, unload the magazine from it. And the magazine is the black thing on the side, not the pistol, on the side of the white, um, the white rectangle. That's the magazine inside of it. It holds uh, cartridges. So the cartridges are would go inside of the magazine, and there will shoot out the actual bullet. So we count all of the mag all of the cartridges. We also count how many magazines they have on them, how many cartridges are in those magazines as well, and if there is a a cartridge inside the chamber of the gun. Okay. And just so that you know, Ms. Carr, you have the ability, if you want to, if you touch your screen, you can write on it just like that if you want to indicate something okay. to the jury. Okay. Would you indicate what you call the magazine? Just just put a circle or something on it. All right. And you said you were talking about a cartridge. What is the cartridge? Okay. So do you put cartridges inside the magazine? Yes. What is the capacity for the magazines uh, that Ms. Geiger the defendant had on her? Uh, she had a 9 millimeter. Okay. And how many rounds would fit into one of the magazines? 15. Okay. And if there are 15, is there one that could be in the chamber as well? Yes. So uh, how many bullets could be in a gun at one time if the, if the magazine is full and you have one in the chamber? 15 plus 1, so 16. Cartridges can be inside of the gun. Showing you states exhibit number 63. <clears throat> now you call this a cartridge, right? Yes. What else? This is also commonly referred to as a bullet? No. Okay. Well, maybe by other people, but not by us, no. By regular people in the world, would we call this a bullet? Yes. Okay. Uh, does the cartridge... Uh, this is the casing portion of it, is that right, or the case portion of it? What we're looking at is the head stamp. Okay. And 
What does it indicate? Uh, the hit stamp indicates the make of uh, the cartridge and also the the nine millimeters right here. Mm -hmm. So that's the caliber. Okay. Number sixty four. Is this going to be the ammo count for the gun and the magazine containing the gun? Yes. How many total cartridges do you have? This one at the top was from the chamber, and these were from the magazine. There were 13 in the magazine and one in the chamber. All right, so if this, if this firearm had been fully loaded with 15 in the magazine and one in the chamber, as you described, it could hold it. You've got two cartridges that are not there. Yes. States exhibit number 65. Uh, you're now looking at how many different magazines did the defendant have on her utility belt? Uh, three total. One was inside the pistol. Okay. So if I went back to the original photographs that, we, that you took of the defendant, recognize what this is? They're holders, but I can't tell from the picture what's inside of them. Okay, what do you normally keep in there? Um, I don't, I don't have them myself, but I've seen officers carry magazines in them. Sometimes uh, mace, I believe, as well. In the other two magazines, can you tell me how many uh, cartridges or what normal people would call bullets did you find in those magazines? Yes, in both of these magazines, there were 15 cartridges each. States Exhibit number 66, is that? The States Exhibit 66 visually depict the ammo count that were in those magazines. Yes. All right. States Exhibit number 67, are they going to all be the same head stamp that you described earlier? Yes. Hornaday 9mm Luger plus P rounds. Yes. All right. All right, so is that going to be the photographs that you took of the defendant, her gun, and her ammunition on September the 6th, 2018? Yes. Uh, as part of your collection of evidence, uh, were you asked or was it arranged for you to get her uniform and her boots and the contents of her uniform? Yes. Did you seize all of those as well? and arrange for those to be put into property at Dallas Police Department. Yes, I did. All right. I'm going to show you State's Exhibit number 68. Can you tell the jury what, where did you take the next series of photographs and tell me where you began and where you ended? Okay, so... From what I recall, I took the next series of photographs um, from the garage on the third floor and basically from the garage moving towards Amber Geiger's apartment and the exterior of her apartment. Okay. Had, had you been made aware that that was apartment 1378 on the third floor? Yes. Okay. So, I mean, you don't know that personally, but you were made aware that that was her apartment, so that's why you took photographs. Yes, that's, that's what I was told, so that's why I took the photographs. Okay. So the first photograph that we have here, States Exhibit number 68, does that indicate a, a placard, a floor placard that's contained on the left inside door of the elevator? Yes. All right, and is there a similar one on the right side as well, if you remember? I don't, I don't recall. Okay. And then is this going to be a photograph from the third floor? that leads to a breezeway and then to the complex. States Exhibit 69. I, I can't tell if it's from the third floor or the fourth floor from this picture. Okay, well you just took a photograph of the third floor elevator. 
Did you not take the next series of photographs from the third floor from the elevator to her apartment? Yes. If this is in sequence, then yes, this would be from the third floor. Okay. Going across the skybridge towards the complex? Yes. States exhibit number 72. This is going to be the hallway leading into the complex. Yes. Okay. As far as your photographs are concerned, do you try... What, what, you tell me, what are you trying to depict with the photographs and... and are you taking photographs so that they kind of overlap one another, so that you can show like a continuous movement? Yes. So wow. when I'm so when I'm taking pictures, I'm basically trying to get um, I'm trying to capture the whole scene. So by doing that, we are advised to take pictures overlapping. So if someone were to lay all of the photographs out, it would be like a clear scene of everything. So yes, I try to take overlapping pictures. And I'm going to show you States Exhibit number 73. So this is just going to be a continuation. And then from your last photograph, is that correct, going down the hallway? Yes. Right. 74. Continuing down the hallway. 75. Yes, this continuing down the hallway. And then once you get to the hallway here at the end, do you have to make a, a turn? Yes. on the inside. You have a, an evacuation route that indicates that you're elevator number and on level three as well. Yes. Okay. Going back now to the hallway. States is in number 76, but will you make that turn? Does that show the turn? And then you're going to go down another hallway. Yes. States is in number 77. Again, the continuation. Yes. States is at 78. Saying this was an, another continuation. Okay. States is at number 79. Is this going to be outside of apartment 1378? Yes. light bar next to the door, which indicates the apartment number you're taking a photograph of. Yes. Is that the apartment? Yes. States exhibit number 81. If this is the same apartment door and apartment number, I just wanted to get a different angle. Okay. Did you notice any kind of a format in front of apartment number 1378? No. Was it just the bare floor that was throughout the entire? Yes. I mean, there were no floor mat or anything outside that apartment, was there? No. States exhibit number 82. Is that going to be the door and the door lock for that particular apartment? Yes. 
All right, in the next series of photographs, starting with States Exhibit Number 83, this appears to be the elevator with the placards indicating the fourth floor. Is that right? Yes. All right. And you see the inside door marker? Yes. You don't remember, though, even on the fourth floor, whether or not there was also an identical one on the other side? No, I don't recall. Okay. On the placard or the sign next to it, does it indicate elevator two, level four? Yes. States exhibit number 84, that's just another photograph of the elevator. Yes. And on the fourth level, it looks like you did take a photograph of the other side of the elevator to indicate the plaque that exists over there, too. Is that right? Yes. And then States Exhibit number 86, is this going to be the doorway that leads from the parking garage down to the fourth level through the breezeway? Yes. States Exhibit number 88. We're now going to be going down the hallway towards apartment 1478. Yes. States Exhibit number 89. Yes, still going down the hallway. Okay, is this going to be before the left turn? Yes. As you make the left turn, states exhibit number 90, you indicate the apartment there at that end, is that right? Yes. Right. Unlike the third floor where there was a flower pot, there's no such similar item here on the fourth floor, is that right? No. Is that... Yes, that's right. There is no flower pot? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> States exhibit number 91. Again, just a continuation down the hallway. Yes. Okay. 92, the same thing? Yes. All right. States exhibit number 93. Is this as you're coming up on those... Uh, there's a set of, looks like, fire doors that are opened up. Is this as you're about to, I mean, you haven't got up to it yet, is that right? Correct. All right, so tell me what we're looking at then from this vantage point before you get to the fire doors. Um, from here we can see there is crime scene tape back here and also a floor mat, a water bottle, and that was just the hallway right before we got to the complainant's residence. Was that residence? What was that residence number? Uh, fourteen seventy-eight. All right. Showing you states exhibit number ninety-four. Is this going to be the complainant's residence? His his front door. Yes. Okay. And then, did you take it from several photographs showing the vantage point of the complainant's front door? Yes. And did you get a state exhibit number 96? Is this going to be the lighted apartment number? Yes. To the left of the door for 1478? Yes. And then states exhibit number 97. Would that be just from another perspective? Yes. All right, I believe earlier you testified that upon your arrival at the scene, you noticed that there were some keys hanging in the door of 1478, is that right? Yes. Can you tell me what we're looking at right there? Um, these are the keys that were hanging in the door, and the door was partially ajar as well when I arrived. Right. Do you remember if that was because officers had thrown the deadbolt to keep it open? I'm not sure. I wasn't told. a closer view, states exhibit number 98, is that going to be the same keys? Yes.
All right, at this point, Ms. Carr, do you go ahead and make entry into the apartment? No. I waited until I had a warrant, and then... Very good. I appreciate you clearing that up. <laughs> That's a very, very important point. Once the warrant had been signed by the judge to allow entry into the apartment, did you enter into apartment 1478? Yes. Okay. Let's, let's talk a little bit about... This is going to be the view. You tell me, what, what is the perspective from this angle? Uh, this was, I took this picture as soon as I opened the door. Mm -hmm. Basically, I stand on the threshold of um, the front door, and I take a picture of everything that I see from my point of view. Okay, and this is going to be from the point of view that you had from the, for, from the front door of apartment 1478? Yes. Okay. Um, I know this is going to sound personal, but it's actually uh, very important. How tall are you? I'm five, three and three quarters. Okay, five, three and three quarter inches tall? Yes. All right. And do you wear the kind of work boots that police officers wear? Yes. All right, so you would uh, have the same kind of shoes, uh, be worn by police officers, and, and so you would be approximately the same height as a five foot three and a three quarter police officer in police boots. Yes. And these photographs that you took, did you take these photographs from your perspective, from your eye? Yes. Okay, and this is State's Exhibit Number 99. So, from your perspective, from your eye, as you're walking in, can you see the couch in the background? Yes. Um, can you tell me what's on the couch, just that you can see from your vantage point? It looks like a pillow over here. Um, this looks like a blanket, but I'm not too sure right now. Okay. But at the very least, you can see the pillow on the far end of that couch from the front door. Yes. Okay. You notice right here, um, is it fair to say that when you took this photograph, directly in front of you is going to be this area right in here? Yes. Okay. Do you see any kind of like... I would call it a baker's rack or uh, a table of some sort with flowers and everything. Does that exist in this photograph? No. What is the condition uh, of, would you consider this kind of the, a cluttered countertop? Yes. Um, you see this stuff here in the background. From Again, from, a, from the perspective of five foot three and three quarter in work boots, can you see all the way back into the living room where the ottoman is and beyond. Yes. All right. What does this appear to be? A lamp. Okay. <clears throat> States exhibit number 100. Yet another documentation again. This is also taken from the perspective of your eye, camera to your eye? Yes. All right. So, same thing as far as the, the layout of the room, is that right? Yes. Right. Can you see all these cushions of the couch, the seat backs? Yes. What is this item right here on the ottoman? Uh, a laptop. That's going to be states as number 100. Are you, can you tell the jury from these photographs, it seems to be largely the same, but with some movement. Can you tell me the kind of movement that you're making and why? Okay, so I was standing at the front door, and then I wanted to turn so I could see what was on the other side and get pictures. Um, as I stated earlier, how I take the overlapping photos, that's basically basically what I was trying to do. So I was just angling my body so that I could get um, pictures of the, uh, the rest of the area of the apartment, what, was, what wasn't seen on this side, which was the kitchen. And can you kind of describe the countertop? Is it consistently cluttered or... Is it just a little bit cluttered? Um, I would say it's more cluttered to this side than it was over here, but I mean, it, it was cluttered. Right. And over here on the wall, what do you notice? 
Uh, paintings? States Exhibit 102. Again, the perspective just a little bit closer now to the kitchen counter. Is that right? Yes. States Exhibit number 103. Mm -hmm. You have a pretty good perspective to this area of the couch. Yes. All right, Ms. Carl, I'm going to show you states exhibit number 106, and I'm going to probably have to zoom in and out. I think later on in your photographs, you've placed plastic placard cards by uh, the mm -hmm. cases. I've always called them casings. I was told the other day they're supposed to be just cases. What do you call them? Fire cartridge cases. FCCs. Cases or casings? Cases. Okay, good. I was, I was told right. I was corrected. All right, is this going to be right here on the floor? Is that going to be a fire cartridge case? Yes. All right. There's one. And if I move this along... It's down further. Is that going to be the second? Yes. So just as far as, again, depicting the room, what, what room are we in right here? This was in the kitchen area. Okay. So in the kitchen area, what is this item right here? Uh, the dishwasher. Right. So you've got a case there and a case there. Yes. Right. States exhibit number 107. Is that going to be a, a close-up of one of the cases? Yes. All right, States Exhibit number 112. So now from the perspective of the kitchen, are we looking at that same wall uh, that you could see when you first walked in that led all the way to the back of the apartment? Yes. Okay. Do you notice any kind of decoration or uh, ornament that's there in the middle of the wall? No. States Exhibit number 121. Have you now, can you go ahead and just describe for the jury how you've repositioned yourself and where you're located now? Uh, now I was pretty much like on the side of the counter and I was just taking a picture so that I could see the overall uh, area of the living room. Okay. Um, let me ask you this. What, what time approximately are you taking these photographs inside 1478? I'm not sure because we waited a while for the warrant. Okay. So definitely after midnight. Okay, so there's been at least a couple of hours after whatever has transpired in this room, at least several hours has passed, including the event itself. Yes. Okay. When you take photographs of the crime scene, this is the condition of the crime scene when you take the photographs. Yes. You don't know, for example, if this ottoman here uh, had been moved a little bit. Correct. I wouldn't know wouldn't unless know. unless an officer told me. Okay. Um, for example.
States Exhibit Number 117. You don't know what the condition of the stool was when the first responding officers, whether it was upright or knocked over, do you? No, I wouldn't know. But these were, this was the condition of the room as it existed when you took photographs? Yes, when I arrived. Okay. And is this right here, is this the edge of the counter? Yes. Okay. I just wanted to orient myself. And what room are we looking into here? Uh, the living room. <clears throat> States Exhibit Number 122. Is that going to just be further into the living room? Yes, this is uh, the living room, but from a slightly different angle. I was showing the couch and the uh, computer and the things on that side. And States Exhibit Number 123. Yes, this is another angle from the living room. Me standing pretty much in front of the counter. Right. And is this going to be the, the television that you described earlier as having been on when you got there? Yes. States exhibit number 124. Yes, this was a, like a mid-range photograph. It shows the ottoman, um, a police vest, a lunchbox, the laptop, and other items that were on top of the ottoman, okay. as well as the couch and stuff. And what was this item right here uh, on the ottoman? Um, it was a bowl, and it appeared to contain like melted ice cream, possibly. next to the ottoman, is that going to be, will you tell me, what is that? A police vest, a receipt, and a lunch bag. That's States Exhibit 125, States Exhibit 126 now, and is that going to be the contents of the, the ottoman, what was on top of the ottoman when you got there? Yes, um, there was a laptop, a remote, the bowl, a game controller, the book, uh, this was um, like a medical bag. Um, there was a wallet over here. I believe this was a cell phone, but I'm not 100% sure right now. Um, I'm not 100% sure what those are right now even. Okay. States exhibit number 129, this car is just gonna be now from the back of the room with the vantage looking towards the front door in the kitchen area. Yes. Okay. And can you describe what, what this area is right in there? Um, that was that was an area that had possible blood on the floor in the living room, as well as um, I believe there was like a cloth, uh, maybe gauze of some type. It appeared to be an area where a lot of blood, evidence of injury, but perhaps treatment. Yes. All right, State's Exhibit Number 131. What is this? Uh, this was just showing the top of the ottoman, everything that was on that was on the ottoman from above. Okay. State's Exhibit Number 132. Does that clear up what this item was? Yes, the laptop. Okay, so just just for like the spatial relationship, on the ottoman, you've got a cell phone, a laptop, the remote control, and a bowl of what looks to be melted ice cream, kind of clustered right there on the ottoman. Isn't that right? Correct. Now, what is the condition of the laptop at this time? Is it on or off? Uh, it was on. States exhibit number 133. In the melted ice cream, it also look like there's some cookie or something in there? Yes. And you indicated that it was at least after midnight, <coughs> states exhibit number 134, 
when you were taking these photographs? Yes. If the TV time is correct, is it, does it sound strange to you that y'all were taking these photographs at about 3 o'clock in the morning? That sounds correct. This, this is a long process, isn't it? Yes. Can you, give, can you give me and the jury an idea how long were you out at the scene processing the scene and then taking care of the evidence after the scene, doing your report, etc.? I arrived at the scene at 11.20 p.m. I didn't leave to the scene until around 5.30 a.m., so that was my only call that night. I was there the entire night. Um, I didn't actually clear, basically, like, taking myself off of the call when I was um, finished for that day until, I believe, 9.59 a.m. I didn't leave the office until around 12 because I remember getting home around 1.00. A little after 1 p.m. So let's just let's just figure out what this is. So what time did you go on duty that day? Um, my shift starts at 10:30 p.m. Okay. So what time do you get to work for a 10:30 shift? Um, around 10:15. All right. So you worked from 10:15 on September the 6th until you got you got home about 1 p.m. September the 7th. Yes. Does that happen? Okay. Oh, yeah, it happens a lot. All right, state's exhibit number 135. What are we looking at here? Uh, this was the, the uh, possible blood evidence that we saw on the floor, um, inside of the living room, on the side of the couch, as well as a cloth and... Um, this appears to be gauze, but I'm not 100% sure at the moment. All right, state's exhibit number 136. Can you tell the jury what? These appear to be right here. Oh, these were um, like earbuds. Is that what you youngsters listen to stuff in your ears with? Yes. That are not connected to wires? Yes. States exhibit number 137. Again, is this going to be a pretty good view of the living room area and the the condition of the couch again when you arrived. Yes, it was another another angle. I tried to make sure I get all four corners. Okay. And then state's exhibit number 138. Is this going to be a transition photograph for you between the living room area and then going into Mr. John's bedroom area? Correct. I know you took a bunch of photographs of all of that, but uh, did, let me just ask you, was there, was there anything of any kind of note that you, that you think I need to cover in the bedroom or the bathroom area? No. Okay, very good. State's exhibit number 140, we're going to go back to the kitchen because now you've placed placards down, is that right? Correct. Tell me why you do that. Why do you take photographs of everything and then stick plastic cones and take the same photographs again? So, I want to take a pictures of the scene when I first arrive, as is the way that I see it when I get there, so I'm the only person in the scene while I'm doing that. So all the pictures that we just viewed, I was the only person in there. And when I go back and I get my pla my uh, evidence markers, I put those down basically to mark the items of evidence. Anything that I want to collect from the scene, I'm going to mark it. And also in case the detectives want to come in um, to the scene, then they can clearly see where the items of evidence are marked so that they're not you know, possibly stepping on them or if any other um, crime scene analysts come into the scene so that they're not stepping or kicking anything because the casings are really small. So it's easy to step on if, if they're not marked. And as far as the casing that you have here by your placard number one, is this one of the, I'm sorry, I said it again, is this one of the cases that you picked up off of the kitchen floor? Yes. Is it the same kind of headstand as the cases are the cartridges that were in the defendant's gun on September the 6th, 2018. Yes, it's the same head stamp. Same head stamp on the second case that you picked up? Yes.
case decision number 141. Is this going to be the front door? Yes. All right. Do you remember earlier I asked you if the door, you indicated the door was ajar? And yes. I asked you whether or not was that because I said officers, but you don't know. Had somebody thrown the deadbolt so that that door could stay open? Possibly, but not in front of me. Okay. I'm not saying that. Okay. Look, here's what I'm asking. Is the deadbolt thrown holding that door open? Yes. Okay. Next to that door, like right very, very close to that deadbolt mechanism, what do you see here on the wall? Light switches. Okay. A bunch of light switches, right? Correct. And I'm showing you state's exhibit number 144. Again, that's the proximity that we're talking about from the door to the light switch. Is that right? Correct. Would you consider that to be very close? Yes. All right. State's exhibit number 147. Ms. Carr, did you notice what appeared to be a bullet defect in the wall? Yes, I did. Did you take a photograph of that? Yes. All right. Can you describe the wall that this was on in the apartment? This was the back wall to the apartment, the same wall where the back door was, basically where the ottoman was behind the ottoman, kind of corner to the couch. I'm going to assume then that this will let us. But you documented this as a bullet hole defect in the back wall. Is that right? As a defect, yes. State's exhibit number 146. Is that going to be in this general location right there? Correct. All right. I do want to actually show one picture from Mr. Jean's closet. Did you see a box, a TV box, in the upper shelf of his closet? Yes. All right. And can you tell me what the box indicates as far as the size of that particular television? 50-inch TV, smart TV, HD TV. All right. State's exhibit number 160. It looks like you've now put some marking around that bullet defect that you saw on the wall. Tell me what you're doing there. Yes. So when we see defects in the walls, we will put evidence markers down. They're like stickers, and we can just stick them around the defect. And I labeled it defect A. Okay. And is this going to be a close-up? Yes. The same thing? Yes. All right. State's exhibit number 163. This is going to be the fourth floor again, as indicated by the elevator? Yes. All right. And can you tell what that is over there? Like a roof. A roof line? State's exhibit number 167. Again, also from the fourth floor. Can you tell what this is right here? 
a roof line. States exhibit number 168. Again, same perspective. You see the roof of the building, is that right? Yes. Right. States exhibit number 169. Um, will you advise whose vehicle this is? Yes, I was told that it was Amber Diamond's vehicle. Did you take various photographs from that particular vehicle? Yes. States exhibit number 174. This is going to be on the other side of the, of the elevator. Is that accurate? Yes. All right. What do you see on the other side? Is it the roof from the other side of the perspective? Yes. And you earlier indicated in these particular areas here are going to be where the, the markers are for the floor number on the elevators? Yes. And this is going to be the evacuation sign showing level four at this particular location. Yes. Okay. We're getting very close. Uh, this is. Uh, all right. So states exhibit number one hundred seventy-seven. Are these going to be the defendant's uniform pants that were collected as part of your your search as well? Yes. Okay. And states exhibit number 178, what does that show? Um, a pocket knife. I want to go back. Well, are you familiar with these pocket knives? Have you seen these before? I've seen pocket knives before, not one like that. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you back on state's exhibit number 57. Right there in her pocket. Do you happen to know what that is? It could be a pocket knife. You're not for sure, though? Not for sure, because I can't see. States exhibit number 184. Are these going to be the work boots that were collected also uh, from the defendant at that particular evening? Yes. And states exhibit number 187. Is this going to be the uniform top of the shirt that you uh, had collected from the defendant as well? Yes. Are you doing all right? I'm okay. Good. I'm going to show you what's in evidence of state's exhibit number. Oops, I'm sorry. Oh, your arm. Two hundred and forty-six is the envelope, and then inside is state's exhibit number two hundred and forty-seven and two hundred and forty-eight. Would you look at those two items and tell me if you recognize? Yes. Okay, what are those? Um, they're two fire cartridge cases from the crime scene. All right, so when in the visual depictions and the photographs of the two cases that were picked up off the floor of Mr. John's apartment, is that going to be what we're looking at right here? Yes. All right, did you see your initials on here to indicate that that's what these are? Yes. All right. At the top. RCT251? Yes. Is that on both? Yes. All right, Your Honor, may I publish to the jury? Yes. Tell me, why would you collect cases? What evidentiary value could these things possibly give us? Uh, well, we collect fire cartridge cases um, because they can be analyzed late, later by our NIBIN team. Now, with the case, you know, some of us are familiar with guns and some are not.
before, as this ends up um, in this particular condition, do you know where the projectile is on this case before it is fired? Yes. Can you show the jury where that would be? Okay. And when the projectile is fired, what happens to the case? Is it ejected from the handgun? Yes, it gets ejected to, from the handgun. Had you been made aware, Ms. Carr, that an individual had been shot this particular evening? Yes. Is that why you found it important to collect the bullet cases, or the cartridge cases? Yes. All right. Your Honor, Matt published to the jury state's exhibit 253 and 254. I'll represent to the court. The deputy sheriff has inspected state's exhibit 253 and has determined it to be safe. Yes. All right, 254 first. This is going to be the magazine, one of the magazines that was contained within the defendant's gun. Is that right? Correct. Okay, and it's empty now. The bullets have been removed? Yes. Ms. Carr, is the way in which a magazine works is that you load your cartridge into this and they will push down until you have 15 of them? Yes. If you wish? Yes. Or any number up to 15? Correct. And then do you insert the magazine into the firearm, therefore having bullets then in the gun, and then you could rack the slide and you can actually put one into the chamber? Correct. Is that how a semi-automatic works? Correct. And then state's exhibit number 253. Is this going to be the handgun that was taken from Ms. Geiger on September the 6th, the defendant on September the 6th, 2019? Correct. Ms. Carr, did you find any guns other than the gun that the defendant had? Were there any other guns in apartment 1478 that you found? No. Did you find anything that were obvious weapons inside 1478 that you seized? No. In and around where the blood stains were that we've seen in your photographs, which by the way, thank you for taking so many photographs that way, you know, the jury or whoever can look at those and look at them from every angle, so. But in and around the area from the couch to where the blood stains were, did you see any weapons, knives, clubs, sticks, guns, hand grenades, anything? No, not in that area, no. Did you notice any injuries on the defendant when you photographed her? No. 
Did you look and see whether or not you could see any visual indications of blood on her uniform? Yes, and I did not see any. I'll pass the words. We are going to break at this point. Um, again, I'm giving you the same admonition. I don't think you'll have access to media, but in the event that you do, please don't watch, read, or listen to anything concerning this case. And we will resume with your cross-examination tomorrow at 8.30. All right.